Hello everyone, my name is Elite Trainer Kenway and I have the most incredible one-two punch theory for you today. Now I absolutely should have posted a video last week, but I didn't and we'll get to the reason why I didn't at the end of this video, but we have no time to waste. I am here to convince you of two things today. First, that the adventure we go on in the Galar region in Pokemon Sword and Shield takes place 3,000 years after the events of Generations 1 through 7 and Generation 9. And also that there is a very common Pokemon that nearly caused the entire downfall of humanity as a whole. This Pokemon is the water type Pokemon Starmie. That's right, I'm here to convince you today that Starmie caused the darkest day, an event that nearly wiped out all of mankind. And rightfully so. Now, I can already see you type into the comments, Kevin, what are you talking about? What do you mean that Starmie sold out the human race? There are two things you should know about Starmie. First, Starmie, yes, that Starmie, the Pokemon that we've had for 25 plus years now, is not from the Pokemon world. Starmie is an alien that fell from space. And this is actually hinted at in its Pokemon Moon Pokedex. The other thing you need to know about Starmie is the fact that Starmie sends mysterious signals into outer space. This is cited in no less than nine different Pokedex entries. Twelve if you count the fact that Diamond and Pearl, Black and White, and Black 2 and White 2 all had the exact same Pokedex entry for Starmie. So something that's stated twelve different times across twelve different games in the Pokemon franchise should be fairly important. And it's something that we have overlooked for decades. In Pokemon Crystal, Professor Oak states that Starmie is sending electric signals out into outer space. Who is Starmie sending those signals to? We have no idea. What those signals are? We have no idea. Why it's sending those signals in the first place? We have no idea. Until now. Starmie, for the past two and a half decades, has been sending help signals to outer space trying to find someone to reach someone in outer space to save pokemon from humanity how do i know that why do i know that well for starters in every single region in the pokemon world humans have either abused pokemon or almost brought down the entire world itself in kanto in the pokemon equivalent of the 1990s we know that we humanity took DNA from the ancient legendary Pokemon Mew and created an even more powerful Pokemon in the form of Mewtwo to which we could control that Pokemon and use it to wage war on other Pokemon and people. In the Johto region, Team Rocket rised up from the ashes after they were crushed, charged into the Slowpoke well and tore the tails off of several Slowpokes while they were just trying to live peacefully. In Hoenn, we awoken the primordial Pokemon Kyogre and Groudon in an attempt to either raise or lower the sea level, an event that almost caused the destruction of our planet had not Rayquaza stepped in at the very last moment to save the world. In Sinnoh, we captured the Pokemon gods of space and or time so that Cyrus could destroy this world and build a new world with him sitting on top of it as a god. In the Unova region, we captured the legendary Pokemon Kyurem in an attempt to freeze the entire Unova region. Three Three thousand years ago, there was a great war in the Kalos region in which both sides decided to send Pokemon out on the battlefield instead of themselves to go and die. As a matter of fact, the reason that the legends of the Swords of Justice exist in the first place is that the Swords of Justice selfishly worked to save Pokemon from humans in the Unovan War. Time and time again, we see humanity grasp at power, and as humanity reaches ever so closer to that power, it's the Pokemon that suffer, it's the Pokemon that die. For our greed, for our selfishness, for our pride, for our glorification. By the time the Alolan games had come around, humanity was traveling through ultra wormholes into ultra space to fight Pokemon on other planets and possibly other dimensions. By the end of the Alolan games, humanity's destructive capabilities are so extremely widespread that any Pokemon would be forgiven for sending a signal into outer space asking for help to save Pokemon from humanity. Over the past 25 years, humanity has time and time and time again proven that the only thing we care about is power and we will risk the safety and health and lives of our Pokemon in order to grasp that power every single time. And you know who was there to watch every time humanity rose up and crushed Pokemon under their boots? Starmie. 
Star meat, as we've always known, is based on the starfish. But did you know that starfish can actually live up to 35 years? Now, not only that, but star you and star meat can be found on every single region that we've visited so far. Star you and star meat can be found in Kanto, Johto, Hoenn, Cinnaba, Unova, Kalos, and Alola. So you put all of this together, a Pokemon that is capable of living for 35 years, who exists on every single continent in the world, a species who, over the past 25 years, has watched humanity slowly tighten its grip on the lives and safety of Pokemon everywhere. And that's not even talking about the fact that the Generation 2 Psychic Pokemon Zatu is frozen in place because of its fear of what it sees in the future. All the way back in Generation 2, Zatu knows what's in store for its Pokemon brethren. And Starmie has to watch it unfold. And one day, Starmie decides enough is enough, we need to help. And let's not even forget about the torture that Starmie itself has had to go through. There are Pokedex entries that state that you can cut off Staryu's limb. So long as its core stays intact, it will regrow that limb. How would these Pokemon professors know that you can cut off Staryu's limb unless they themselves were torturing Staryu to find out what it could do? At some point, Starmie, just like any intelligent creature would, decided that enough is enough, and they sat on the beaches of every region of the Pokemon world and sent signals into outer space, begging for someone to come and save the Pokemon from the scourge that is humanity. And that help came in the form of Eternatus and the Darkest Day. That's right. I believe the Darkest Day happened after the events of Generations 1 through 7 and the events of Generation 9. But that's only half the story. Let's talk about the Gala region and why I believe that the Sword and Shield games take place 3,000 years in the future. For starters, Pokemon Sword and Shield do not mention characters or specific events in any way, shape, or form from the previous seven generations, and they are the first set of games in the main series to do this. The only reference to any of the other games in the past in Sword and Shield are the Pikachu and Eevee given to you if you have the save file of Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee in your Nintendo Switch. And that absolutely exists outside side of the lore of Pokemon. But you may be saying if you're very wise to your Pokemon trivia. What about the tourist in the Alola region who mentions power spots? Well, thanks to the most recent Scarlet and Violet trailer, we now know that the Galar region is not the only region in the Pokemon world with power spots. We now know that the Paldea region also has power spots where Pokemon can terrestrialize. So it is absolutely possible that the tourist was from Paldea and not from Galar. The only other reference to Sword and Shield in Generation 7 is of course the G-Max Toxtricity poster in the Game Freak offices in Heia Heia City. But of course, just like the Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee reference, this reference absolutely exists outside of the Pokemon lore and the Pokemon world. So lack of references are one thing, but why do I really believe that the Sword and Shield games take place outside the same time frame as the rest of the games? Well, because the people of the Galar region treat Pokemon so incredibly differently from the people of every other region we've seen so far. First off, let's talk about the powerful Pokemon of the Galar region. The powerful Pokemon of the Galar region are kept in three locations. The Wild Area, the Isle of Armor, and the Crown Tundra. The Isle of Armor and the Crown Tundra are completely separate from the rest of the Galar region, and you are only able to travel to those two areas if you have permission. So that leaves us with the Wild Area. The Wild Area exists in almost the dead center of the Galar region, and you not only have to enter two of its three ports by a train, but you also have to go through a checkpoint to go through any of its three ports. As a matter of fact, you as the player character were not even supposed to enter the Wild Area when you did. The only reason that you entered the Wild Area when you did is because of the Wooloo on the train tracks. So it would seem as though the Galarian government is fairly restrictive as to who can and cannot interact with these powerful Pokemon. But that's not all. We also know that the Galarian government did everything in its power to hide the existence of Zacian and Zamazenta from the Galarian citizens. But why, you may ask? Zacian and Zamazenta were heroes. Zacian and Zamazenta saved the Galarian region from, from Gigantamax Pokemon. Exactly. Zacian and Zamazenta were so powerful that the Galarian government decided that for everyone's best interest, they should vanish with history. How do we know this? Well, for starters, the government would absolutely have the means and the power and the motive 
to block off the statues of Zacian and Zamazenta and Stoan side. And let's not and let's not forget about the fact that Sonia, the granddaughter of the region's professor, needed to find books that were written outside of the Galar region to find out about the existence of Zacian and Zamazenta. As a matter of fact, Sonia tells you that she could not find anything mentioning Zacian or Zamazenta in any of the Galarian history books. So what did Sonia have to do? She had to turn to a book written in another region. Now, I believe that that book came from the Unova region. And that is actually a theory written by Ben Lamero at Nintendo.Destructoy.com, where he mentions the fact that the Three Swords of Justice came over to the Galar region in the Crown Tundra DLC. So in his theory, he states that Zacian and Zamazenta fought alongside the Three Swords of Justice to save Pokemon during the Univan War. Now let's talk about how the Galarian government keeps keeps its citizens afraid of the power of Pokemon. We know that just outside of Turfield in Galar, there's a depiction of Gigantamax Toxtricity. The question we've had since the release of Sword and Shield is, is why? Why is there a depiction of G-Max Toxtricity right there in Turfield? It was put there by the Galarian government to keep the Galarian citizens afraid of the power of Pokemon. Now, with that being said, let's talk about the gym challenge. In every other region we've been to so far outside of Galar and Alola, when you face a gym, you walk into a small building and have a battle with the gym leader that is watched by maybe a dozen people, if that. And these battles go widely unrecognized by the general public. But now take a look at the Galar region. The Galar region is the only region in the Pokemon world that makes a giant spectacle of its gym battles. Now, why would they do that? Why would the Galarian government feel the need to make a giant spectacle of these gym battles? Again, it's to remind the people of Galar of how powerful and how frightening Pokemon can be. Using the gym challenge as a caveat, the Galarian government can display the power of Gigantamax Pokemon in a safe and controlled environment. That is the reason why in every major gym, each gym leader aside from peers has a Gigantamax Pokemon. And these stadiums are packed with tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people every single day during the weeks that the gym challenge is active. This serves as a constant reminder of the Galarian citizens how powerful Pokemon could be. And this is a constant reminder why citizens of Galar should not go out and seek out more powerful Pokemon than what they can handle. So that's pretty much it. I believe that after decades, if not centuries, of constantly watching humanity abuse and threaten the lives in the very home of the Pokemon, a group of Starmie gathered together across the entire planet to send signals into space begging for help. And that help came in the form of Eternatus and the Darkest Day. This destruction and eventually rebuilding of the Pokemon world also explains why there are so many legendary Pokemon from across the entire world underground in the Crown Tundra. When Eternatus showed up and Pokemon in the Galar region and possibly even the rest of the world started to Gigantamax and crush civilizations under their feet, all of the most powerful, the legendary Pokemon who could escape, did escape. And they followed either Zacian, Zamazenta, or possibly even Calyrex to the Galar region, to the Crown Tundra, and hid underground where they lay dormant for thousands of years. We know that the Mewtwo created in the Kanto region is the only Mewtwo to exist in the canon of the video games. Now, if you are paying attention, you may have just caught a moment ago when I said Pokemon all over the world were, were Dynamaxing and Gigantamaxing. I believe that when Eternatus first landed on the Pokemon world, it spread Dynamax energy all across the entire Pokemon world. And over the course of the next 3,000 years, all of that energy started to dissipate, leaving only the Galar region as a place where Pokemon can Dynamax and Gigantamax because the egg of Eternatus is still there. Now that Eternatus has been captured by the end of the Sword and Shield storyline, we can expect to see the Dynamax phenomenon eventually completely wipe itself out from the Galar region. Chairman Rose signified the last remaining gasp of that old evil mindset that people of the old Pokemon world used to have. That is it for my theory today, guys. If you want to stick around for a few more minutes, I'm going to talk about a few meta things here in just a second. Hey guys, real quick, I want to get this, this done fairly quickly because I don't want the entire video to be 20 minutes long. Um, but I wanted to address what I said at the beginning of the video when I said that I should have put something out last week. I absolutely should have put something out last week and I could have put something out last week. I had a video finished 
but um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail. If you want the full story, you can you can check it out on my Twitter. Um, but very basically, I spent two and a half weeks researching uh, what was going to be a massive video, probably the, the most heavily researched, definitely the most heavy, heavily researched one I've ever done. And um, I, got, I got the research done, got all the information put out in spreadsheet the way I wanted it, got the script written, um, got, got the recording done, got the editing done. Video was 99.9% .9 done, even got the thumbnail done for it. Um, but... I watched it and it was just boring. Um, ended up reading 2,072 Pokedex entries as research for the video, and the video itself just ended up being me reading a bunch of Pokedex entries on screen, and I I don't like that. Um, it was very boring. I was very unhappy with the product, and I don't want to waste your guys' time putting out something that that. If I find it boring, I'm not going to put it out because if I find it boring, everybody's going to find it boring. Um, Toby has has coached me on that and and made me realize that quantity is better than no quality is better than quantity um, every single time. So if there's a video that I'm not satisfied with, I'm not going to put out any more subpar videos for you guys. Everything from here on out, starting with this video, is going to be is, is going to be the best I can put out. And as you guys will see in this video, I'm constantly improving. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to apologize for not getting something out last week. But like I said, if it's not worth watching, I don't want to put it out. And that video wasn't worth watching. And who knows, maybe in six months or so, I'll be able to put that video out and be proud of it but i'm not gonna put out something i'm not proud of not not anymore uh, not not ever again uh, so i hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your week and i'll see you soon peace